Hi everyone. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium and will be your tour guide to the universe this evening. And with me, I have our usual voice in the sky, one of my students, Eli, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, hello, my name is Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy student at UMD. So Eli is going to be watching the comments. Um, so if you have any questions uh, that come up as we are exploring the universe, please feel free to leave them down there. Eli will let me know when they, um, when comments are there, when questions are there. Um, and we'll also take some time at the end to get to any questions that maybe we missed or any last minute questions you have. So our goal today is to explore the universe. We've done some shows where we've looked at kind of the night sky as seen from here on Earth. Uh, we've done a couple shows where we've taken you through the solar system, but there's even more out there to explore. Um, and so I am going to switch us over to our program here. Um, so the program we're using to do our tour of the universe is called Open Space. Um, it is actually a free planetarium software um, that if you have enough space on your computer, you could go and download and play with yourself. Um, I do have the link to the website in the description. But we are going to start our tour as we often do at home here on the Earth. And even just right near the Earth, you can see that we have a little line circling around the Earth, and that is the space station. That is the ISS. And so we're going to go take a quick little look once I can navigate there. There's been a lot of talk about the ISS lately since we had our first commercial spacecraft to take astronauts up to the ISS, which was a really exciting experience. Um, so there is our International Space Station, and it usually houses, um, Eli, I know you looked this up, what was it? Normally there's three to four at any given time? Uh, yeah, it's max, cap or max capacity is six, but on average it's three or four. Yeah, we've got to have people up there at all time to be able to run things and make sure it, you know, stays working and running. Um, so there are always some people living up there, looking down on the Earth. Um, all right, so we'll adventure out even further. You will hear we now have a visitor. Um, one of my cats has decided to come and say hi. Um, so we're going to keep adventuring out. And I apologize if um, I'm a little slow transitioning or moving to things. This is a new program for us um, since we don't have access to our usual software we use for planetarium shows. Um, and so there are some things that I'm still getting used to. Hi. Quinn saying hi, everyone. If she's still here later, I'll, sh I'll let her have a moment on camera. Um, so as we zoom out and away from the Earth, we're going to kind of focus on where we live, our solar system. Of course, at the very center of our solar system sits the sun, our closest star. And then we have eight planets which are divided into the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then we have our four outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And you can see as we zoom out, those four inner planets are all pretty close together and pretty close to the sun. But as we zoom further and further out, these outer planets are spread much further apart. And we end up getting really far away from the sun. Now our sun and eight planets are not the only thing in our solar system. In between Mars and Jupiter sits the asteroid belt, and then out past Neptune sits the Kuiper belt. Both of these are just rings of rocky or icy debris. Um, so the asteroid belt is a bunch of rocky stuff. 
the Kuiper Belt is a bunch of icy stuff. And this is really just um, chunks of rock and ice that are left over from when the planets formed that didn't go into forming planets. And then on top of that, we also have dwarf planets. Um, so Pluto is the largest of the dwarf planets, but there are a total of five. So in addition to Pluto, there is Haumea, Maki Maki, which is my favorite to say, Ceres, and Eris. And so that is just everything within our solar system. If we look out even further, we see we're not really passing anything else yet. And that's because there's not a whole lot of stuff near our solar system. There is a lot of space in space. There's a lot of space between stars. And one way we can easily see that is I am going to turn on our constellations. And so you can see that even here, as we are pretty far out from the outer edge of Neptune's orbit, the lines of the constellations all still look pretty much the same. We don't see any changes. And that's because we're not even out to the closest star yet. So the closest star is about four light years away. And what that means is if you travel at the speed of light, which is very fast, um, I've blanked on the actual number, <laughs> um, but if you travel at that speed for one year, that's a light year. And so if we travel at that speed for four years, then we'll get to our closest star. And so uh, we'll have to keep going out even further and even further and keep going and keep going until finally we start reaching other stars and we start to see the lines of the constellations start to warp a little bit. Because the stars in the constellations are not actually right next to each other and they're not all the same distance from Earth. It's just our perspective, how we see them from our viewpoint here on the Earth. But these constellations and the stars in them are actually spread out in all three dimensions. And so as we go out, we really start to see those lines starting to warp as we are now out among the stars. Now, if you were with us the other week when we did our show all about aliens, um, one of the things that I didn't get to talk too much about is uh, how we are possibly communicating with civilizations that might be out there. And one of the things that I don't think a lot of people realize is we have actually been sending broadcast out into space for about 70 years now. Well, no, it's more than that, isn't it? 80 years? It's about 80 years now. Um, and so that's just from TV and radio. These things are travel out away from the Earth and out into space. And because we have been broadcasting for so long, our communications have actually stretched or have actually reached out to the nearest stars. And so the sphere you're seeing is how far out our communications, inadvertent as they were, but communications nonetheless, have actually traveled through our galaxy. And so if there are any civilizations around these nearest stars, they may have seen some of our TV shows or heard some of our radio programming. Um, which is kind of crazy to think about. Let's get these constellation lines back off for a little bit. Because now that we are out among the stars, 
there are some other things that we can start to explore. Now, one of the things that we've talked about in a past show are exoplanets, these planets that are around other stars. And to give you an idea of just how much we found, every little blue circle you're seeing here is circling a star where we have found planets around that star. That's a lot of planets out there. And that's just the closest stars to us that we've been able to study so far. That's a lot, which is really exciting. Now looking at the stars themselves, stars often are in groups or clusters. Um, one type of cluster is called an open cluster. Let me get that pulled up real quick. Here we go. And so all of these green circles are showing where open clusters are. And if you don't know, um, you may actually know an open cluster already. And let me see if I can find it real quick here in the sky. I may be a little bit too far away. Let's get a little bit closer to home. and see if I can find it. This is also what happens when I put myself on the spot and try and find something very quickly. All right, well, I'm going to keep searching, um, but I will pull up the picture. Um, one of these open clusters is the Pleiades cluster, which is something um, that you might hear us talk about, especially in our winter shows, because the Pleiades can be seen up in the winter sky in or near the constellation of Taurus the Bull. And this is a classic example of an open cluster. It's a small group of stars, um, usually, you know, less than a thousand, that are loosely grouped together. And a lot of them tend to have a bluish glow to them. And that's because these are groups of young stars. And when you have a group of young stars, you have some of these big, hot, blue stars. And they're so bright that they dominate the light coming from this group. And it makes the whole cluster look bluish in color. Now that's just one type. The other type of cluster that we see for stars is called a globular cluster. And so here you're seeing these little yellow specks or the yellow spots showing you where some globular clusters are. And they get that name because, quite honestly, they look like a glob of stars. Um, and so here's a pretty good example of one. This is uh, M13. Um, this is a classic globular cluster that you're seeing. And these tend to have a lot more stars, tens of thousands of stars that are all packed close together in this kind of spherical blob. And that's why they're called globular clusters, because it's, it's a glob of stars. Uh, now, these tend to have a redder color to them because unlike our open clusters, which tend to be a young group of stars, globular clusters tend to be an older group of stars. And so those big bright blue stars have lived and died and all that's left are small red stars. And so that's the color that dominates um, our picture coming from this cluster. Now, other than stars, there are a lot of other things in our galaxy as well. Um, as you can see, as we stare right into the heart of our galaxy, uh, there is a lot of gas and dust spread throughout our galaxy. A lot of it is concentrated in this kind of line we're seeing going across. And that's because it's all concentrated within our Milky Way galaxy, which is shaped like a disk. And I'll show you that in just a second. But there are lots of different types of um, gas clouds that we can see. Um, so 
One of these types are what we call star forming regions. And they're given that name um, pretty self explanatory. These are big gas clouds where stars are born. And you actually probably have looked at one without even realizing it because there is a big star forming region in the constellation of Orion. And it's called the Orion Nebula. And it's on screen right now. And there is Orion up in the sky. And so you can see that blue spot that's coming down from uh, his belt in his sword. And I'll turn us around so Orion is right side up. Um, that is where the Orion Nebula is in his sword. And this is a solar nursery. We have lots of little baby stars being formed from the gas in this nebula, in this gas cloud. So this is a gas cloud that brings about the life of stars, but we also have some gas clouds that are out because of uh, a star dying. And so one of those types of gas clouds, of nebulae, are called a planetary nebula. And you can see um, marked on your screen with the blue triangles are where a bunch of planetary nebulae are. And a classic example of one is called the Ring Nebula. And so this is what's going to happen to lower mass stars, stars like our sun. Um, and so what happens is once they reach the end of their lives and they no longer have hydrogen to turn into helium, they start to puff up and the outer layers kind of billow out and you end up getting um, the core of the dead star left behind in the center is what we call a white dwarf. And then it's surrounded by these kind of circular spherical shells of gas that kind of were blown off of the star as it was dying. And that's what gives it this kind of ring shape to it. Now, the main planetary nebula is a misnomer. Um, they have nothing to do with planets. It's just when astronomers first started looking at these objects through telescopes, they noticed that they looked fairly similar to how a planet looks through a telescope. Um, but it's, it's not a planet. It has nothing to do with planets. Um, it's just what they named it when they weren't sure what it was. And then as things do, the name kind of stuck. So what about bigger stars? Um, bigger stars go through a much more dramatic death. Um, they explode in a giant explosion we call a supernova. And just like with our planetary nebula, where you end up with this kind of cloud of gas that's surrounding our dead remnant of the star, uh, the same thing happens with the supernova you end up with a bunch of gas that's blasted out by the explosion uh, surrounding the dead remnant of the star that's left behind afterwards. And so you end up getting what we call a supernova remnant. And a good example of that is on the screen. This is the Crab Nebula. What's really cool is the supernova that created the Crab Nebula was actually observed. Um, it was observed by Chinese astronomers in, looking at 1054. Um, and so people actually saw that supernova explosion that happened, that created this nebula, which I think is pretty cool. All right, so that is everything just within our galaxy itself. Um, so let's keep heading out out and away. We're going to keep passing by stars and clusters and gas clouds as we make our way out of our galaxy. And as we are now out of the galaxy, we can see this kind of view of it. So our galaxy is what we call a spiral disk galaxy. So it's shaped like a disk, like a frisbee. And that's why um, we see it kind of concentrated in like a line across the sky because we are inside this disk. And so we see all of the 
dust and gas and concentration of stars kind of as this streak across the sky. But our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, which is pretty big, so traveling at the speed of light for 100,000 years. And it's a pretty average sized galaxy. Um, now, one of the things that I like to do is, real quickly, I'm going to turn on those constellation lines again. And so you can see them there in the lower left. And what those lines are kind of showing you are what we see in the nighttime sky. So in our portion of the galaxy, that is how much of our galaxy, how much of the stars in our galaxy we see in our nighttime sky. It's just the few thousand closest stars to us. Most of the stars in our galaxy are too far away for us to see. Um, and so we actually see just a tiny, tiny fraction of what is in our galaxy. Now, if we keep looking out past our galaxy, our galaxy is not alone. We actually are in uh, what we call a local group of galaxies. And so that is the kind of closest green dots that you can see. Our local galaxy has uh, three bigger galaxies. The Milky Way is the second biggest. The largest is the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, which you can actually see with your naked eye without a telescope in the fall sky. And then there's also the Triangulum Galaxy, which is the third largest. All of these are spirals, look a lot like our Milky Way. But then all of the other galaxies that are in our local group are really just tiny little dwarf galaxies that are oddly shaped or maybe kind of spherical. They're a lot like globular clusters, just galaxy sized rather than star cluster sized. But even just our local group is not the only thing that's out there. As we keep heading out, we'll see more and more points of light popping up. And so now what you're seeing here, every point of light that you're seeing is not a star, it's another galaxy. And so we can keep going out and we see more and more of these galaxies and we keep going and see more and more galaxies. There it goes. And more, and more, and more, <laughs> and more. And more. Until we reach the edge of our observable universe. Now, you may be wondering why these kind of galaxies that we've mapped out kind of come off on kind of two sides and there seems to be a section in the middle that's missing dots, missing points for galaxies. Um, and it's not because the galaxies don't exist there. This has to do with how we can collect pictures and data. Um, where that kind of void is, that missing section in the middle, in order to look out that way, we have to look through our old galaxy. And because it's so filled with other stars and gas and dust, that blocks our view of what sits out past our galaxy. And so our galaxy blocks our view in those directions. And so that's why we have kind of missing chunks here. It's not that things don't exist, we just can't see them because our galaxy is in the way. But based off of what we can see, we estimate that there are hundreds of billions to maybe even trillions of other galaxies out there, which is just mind boggling. Um, and then at the very outer edge, you'll notice this kind of sphere of kind of bluish and reddish, greenish. Um, this is what I said was the edge of our observable universe. So it's not 
necessarily all that's out there or the edge of the universe itself. It's just as far back as we can see. And that's because our universe is a certain age. It's about 14 billion years old. And so light has only been able to travel for 14 billion years. And so anything that's 15 billion light years away, the light from it just hasn't had time to reach us. So there's a limit on what we can see based off of how long light has been able to travel, but that doesn't mean that's the actual limit to our universe. Um, now, the sphere is actually what we call the cosmic microwave background, and it is remnant heat from the Big Bang itself, which is pretty awesome. All right. So we've reached the edge of our observable universe, which means the only thing left to do now is slowly make our way home. And so we're gonna head back in through all of the galaxies. Into our local group. Into the Milky Way. Back to our sun. And back to our solar system. So there you have it. A very brief tour of what we can find in the universe. And that's just a small bit. That's kind of the, the big highlights. There is a lot more out there, but it would definitely take longer than half an hour to show and tell all of that. And so we will, we will leave it there. Um, so let me switch back over. Um, so yeah. That's our tour through the universe. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll check in with Eli now to see if there are any questions. Uh, nope, nothing yet. No? <clears throat> All right. Well, if you do have any questions, now is a good time to leave them in the comments. We'll give you um, a few minutes to see if anything else pops up. Um, and while we're waiting, I can give you um, a little peek at what we're going to be doing next week. Um, and so next Wednesday is another iteration of our constellation story time. Since we have a new month, there are some new constellations up in the sky. And so we're going to take you through those and some of the stories behind them. And then on Saturday, we're doing another version of our history of STEM, um, this time focusing on the amazing women who made um, awesome uh, discoveries in the field of astronomy. Uh, and so we'll be doing that on Saturday, which is going to be exciting. Um, Eli, you have anything to add while we wait? Um, well, there are no questions. Um, as for anything else, um, I don't know. I, I, I always think it's uh, really cool to think about the uh, um, local group and how the Milky Way and Andromeda are kind of the two powerhouses. And I like to think about how um like how interesting it would be over time to watch the motion of all the uh, the dwarf galaxies and how they're affected by how those two move um yeah unfortunately we don't have a camera out that far um but, or time <laughs> right or time to do that yeah that'd take a while um but yeah i, I always think that's really interesting um because I, I guess i don't know the exact amounts but those dwarf galaxies weigh significantly less by like magnitudes right yes yeah yeah they're they're pretty small yeah I think that'd be really cool to see. And then uh, also when the Milky Way and Andromeda come together, I think that's going to be. God, yeah, I, I didn't touch on that. Um, if you've been to one of our uh, fall shows, you may have heard this. Um, but the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way Galaxy are actually coming together. They're going to meet each other and merge together in, I think it's like 5 billion years. Yeah, somewhere around there. So um, galaxies colliding are not actually that dramatic. 
Um, because right. as we've seen, uh, a galaxy is, there's a lot of space between stars. There's a lot yes. of space in space. Most and so indeed. when galaxies merge, there's so much space between the stars that the stars actually just pass by each other. They mm-hmm. don't really hit each other. Um, but it's going to be cool if we could still be around to watch as yeah. the two get closer, that little tiny blob that we see as the Andromeda galaxy is going to get yeah, bigger and bigger turn into a galaxy in our sky. It'll be like a movie. Yeah. Lois. I I'm really so wish I could see that. I know. It'd be so cool. And I, I, I like to wonder too, how bright the sky is going to be. Like if it'll just be like daytime. Outside. Just because of so many stars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I wish I could see that. Um, no, well, maybe... need to make a time machine. Yeah, may, or maybe SpaceX's next venture will be like cryogenics and <laughs> stuff like that. We'll see. I think they're focused on getting to Mars first. Yeah, probably. I think Elon's kind of one track minded on the red planet for now. But... but, I mean, cryogenics could be a good way of, you know, making the time pass. Yeah, what's yeah. the flight time to Mars? Isn't it like four or five years? It's no, it's a couple months. Oh, it is. Okay. Depending oh, on yeah. where it is in the orbit. Okay. Um, but I think it's it's a few months. Okay, I was way off. Um, it, oh yeah, I think you're right. I think like the moon is three days, Mars is three months, mm-hmm. and then yeah, something like that. Um, but yeah, that would be a bummer. That's a long car ride. Um, yeah. So I know but, a lot um, of uh, a lot of sci-fi tends to have like either sleep like or cryo um, something to let the crew just kind of zonk out. Yeah, that's like what Interstellar did. Like they went into those like water baths. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. But well, uh, no more comments or no more questions. Um, All right. So. Yeah. Well, we will. Call it a night then. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Um, we have again some interesting shows coming up next week. Uh, as always, if you've missed a show or want to rewatch, you can always find them on our YouTube page, which is linked in the comments. Um, but thanks for joining us. We hope you have a great night and a great rest of your weekend, and we'll see you later. Bye.